Thank you very much for those very kind words and thank you for inviting me to this distinguished uh, series of lectures. Uh, as um, Professor Cooper said, I, I want to talk about the defense of the West and of course the, great, the first question is what does that word West mean? And it seems to me that there is a, a great difference between those parts where the Western political project has taken root and those where it has not. Wherever the Western vision of political order has gained a foothold, there is freedom of conscience, not merely the freedom publicly to disagree with others about matters of faith and morality, but also the freedom to satirize solemnity and to ridicule nonsense, including solemnity and nonsense of the sacred kind. Uh, and universities traditionally have been uh, havens of satire and ridicule, uh, which, alas, um, are becoming more and more po-faced uh, and puritanical as the years go on. Freedom of conscience requires secular government. But what makes secular law legitimate? That question is the starting point of Western political philosophy and is now mired in academic controversy. But to cut the story short, the consensus among modern thinkers is that the law is made legitimate by the consent of those who must obey it. This consent is shown in two ways, by a real or implied social contract, whereby each person agrees with every other to the principles of government, and by a political process through which each person participates in the making and enacting of the law. And we're familiar with that in all Western countries. The right and duty of participation is what we mean or ought to mean by citizenship. And the distinction between political and religious communities can be summed up in the view that political communities are composed of citizens, but religious communities of subjects, of those who have submitted. And if we want a simple definition of the West as it is today, it would be wise, I think, to take the concept of citizenship as our starting point. That is what the millions of migrants are roaming the world in search of, an order that confers security and freedom in exchange for consent. The problem is that although that is what people want, it doesn't make them happy. Something is missing from a life based purely on consent and on the polite accommodation with your neighbors, something of which Muslims retain a powerful image through the words of the Quran. This missing thing goes by many names, sense, meaning, purpose, faith, submission. People need freedom, but they also need the goal for which they can renounce it. And that is the thought contained in the word Islam, the willing submission from which there is no return. It goes without saying that the word Islam has different connotations for an Arabic speaker than it has for a speaker of Turkish, Malay or Bengali. Only 20% of Muslims in the modern world are Arabs, and 10% of Arabs are Christians. Turks who live under a secular law derived from the legal systems of post-Napoleonic Europe are seldom disposed to think that as Muslims they are required to live in a, cons uh, a state of continual submission to a divine law that governs every aspect of social and political life. Arabs, however, who feel the mesmerizing rhythms of the Quran as an unbrookable current of compulsion are apt to take Islam in its literal meaning of submission. For them, this particular act of submission may mean renouncing not freedom only, but also the very idea of citizenship. It may involve retreating from the open dialogue on which the secular order depends into the shade of the Quran, as Said Qutb put it in a, a disturbing book that has been an inspiration to the Muslim Brotherhood ever since. Citizenship is precisely not a form of brotherhood of the kind that follows from a shared act of heartfelt submission. It is a relation among strangers, a relation that joins us in this room, me to you and you to me, a collective apartness in which all fulfillment and all meaning are confined to the private sphere. To have created this form of renewable loneliness is the great achievement of Western civilization. But of course that way of describing it raises the question whether the achievement is worth defending, and if so, how. 
My answer is that yes, it is worth defending, but only if we recognize the truth that the present conflict with Islamism makes vivid to us, the truth that citizenship is not enough, and it will it, that it will endure only if it is associated with meanings to which the rising generation can attach its hopes and its search for identity. Now, there's no doubt that the secular order and the search for meaning coexisted quite happily when Christianity provided its benign support to both. But Christianity has retreated from public life and is now being driven from private life as well. For people of my generation, <coughs> it seemed for a while as though we could rediscover meaning through culture. The artistic, musical, literary and philosophical traditions of our civilization bore so many traces of a world-transforming significance that it would be enough, we thought, to pass those things on. Each new generation could then inherit, by means of them, the spiritual resources that it needs. But we reckoned without two all-important facts. First, the second law of thermodynamics, which tells us that without an injection of energy, all order decays. Secondly, the rise of what I call the culture of repudiation, as those appointed to inject that energy become increasingly fatigued with the task and eventually jettison the cultural baggage under the weight of which they had been staggering. If you attended a university course in English in my youth, you would be taught to enter into dialogue with Shakespeare, Swift, Jane Austen and Eliot to search their, words, or their works for the vision of human life and its meaning that they contain and to make that vision your own. A similar course today might very well teach you how to set those works behind a screen of deconstruction uh, and inquisition to see them as something incurably alien belonging to an oppressive order dominated by dead white European males. The consoling vision of happiness in Shakespeare and Jane Austen would be rewritten as an illusion and a mystification whose effect was to entrench the existing forms of inequality and give permanence to arbitrary power. Now, I don't myself believe any of that, uh, but attempts at refutation are of little help when the thing to which you are opposed is not a belief but a culture. And this culture of repudiation has tra transmitted itself through the media and the schools, across the spiritual landscape of Western civilization, leaving behind it a sense of emptiness and defeat, a sense that there is nothing to believe in or to endorse, save only the freedom to believe. And a belief in the freedom to believe is neither a belief nor a freedom. It is hardly surprising if so many Muslims in our cities today regard the civilization that surrounds them as doomed even if it is a civilization that has granted to them the one thing that they may be unable to find where their own religion triumphs, which is a free, tolerant and secular rule of law. For they were brought up in a world of certainties, and around them they encounter only doubts. Now there is no future, I think, in that culture of re repudiation, for it is a culture fixated on the past, constantly rehearsing and amplifying the sins of the forefathers without ever achieving an alternative world of virtue. If this were all that Western civilization can offer, then it can't survive. It will give way to whatever future civilization can offer hope and consolation to the young and which can fulfill their deep-rooted human need for social membership. Citizenship, as I've described it, doesn't fulfill that need and that is why so many Muslims reject it. But citizenship is an achievement that we can't forego if the modern world is to survive. It is the thing on which, we, on which we have built our prosperity, our peace, and our stability. And even if it doesn't provide happiness, it is the thing that defines us and which we cannot renounce without ceasing to be. What is needed, it seems to me, is not to reject citizenship as the foundation of social order, but to provide it with a heart. And in seeking that heart, we should, I believe, return to Christianity's gifts to us, the first of which is the gift of forgiveness. By living in a spirit of forgiveness, we not only uphold the core value of citizenship, but also find the path to social membership that we need. Happiness doesn't come from the pursuit of pleasure, nor is it guaranteed by freedom. It comes from sacrifice, 
That is the great me message of the Christian religion and it is the message that is conveyed by all the memorable works of our culture. It is the message that has been lost in the noise of repudiation, but which, it seems to me, can be heard once again if we de devote our energies to retrieving it. And in the Christian tradition, the primary act of sacrifice is forgiveness. The one who forgives sacrifices vengeance and renounces thereby a part of himself for the sake of another. Nietzsche saw Christianity as an expression of the slave morality, the morality of those whose principal social passion is not desire for success, but resentment of the success of others. Ressentiment, as he called it, uh, it that's the French word for resentment, um, is the root, according to Nietzsche, not only of Christian humility, which is the inverted form of the desire for revenge, but also of the egalitarian and socialist ideologies of the modern world, or at least of the modern world as he knew it then. In a virtuous society, he thought, resentment would be kept in check as the strong exert their control over the weak. In a Christian society, however, resentment is the guiding principle of the culture and the source of the egalitarian attitudes and abject defeatism by which Nietzsche saw himself surrounded. Now, Max Scheler, in uh, Ressentiment, his book on this topic, offers a decisive refutation of Nietzsche's critique of the, criti of the Christian religion. Far from being an attempt by the weak and cowardly to seize power over their betters, he argues, Christianity is an attempt to confer power on everyone through spiritual discipline and the regime of forgiveness. Resentment exists in modern societies not because of Christianity but in spite of it. The principal cause is not religion, but its opposite, the obsessive fixation on the things of this world, which leads people to envy their neighbours and to seek to dispossess them. Moreover, Shaler argues, resentment is promoted by the socialist state, which is able to confiscate the rewards of successful individuals and to satisfy the vengeful, vengeful feelings of the failures. I am inclined to agree with Shaler both in his critique of a certain kind of socialism and in his exculpation of Christianity from the charge levelled by Nietzsche. But his argument only serves to underline the fundamental puzzle. Why should we resent rather than rejoice in the good things that others possess? This was the question which has puzzled uh, religious people down the centuries and which the Judeo-Christian tradition has constantly attempted to answer. It's a striking feature of animal behavior that members of herds and packs do not harbor resentment, even when they fight. Once the pecking order is established, peace prevails, and all antagonism is quickly forgotten. As Conrad Lorenz argued in his famous study of aggression, animals exhibit aggression, which has a functional role in their search for territory, but not hatred, which serves no species need. People are not like that for the reason that their actions and motives are not determined only by the needs of species life or by their genetic inheritance. They also live as individual moral beings in the shadow of judgment. Hence they can feel humiliated, degraded. They can harbor thoughts of revenge and triumph and invest in those thoughts all the self-centered ambition of their slighted natures. The critic and anthropologist uh, René Girard has considered this matter in a series of striking books such as Violence and the Sacred and the Scapegoat and Things Hidden Since the Beginning of the World. Girard believes that violence proceeds from the mimetic or imitative nature of social ties formed by rivalry. This violence must be released from time to time and such is the function of the scapegoat, the victim, the one who is cast out and who bears the collective guilt on his shoulders. Through his death, the scapegoat relieves us of, of pent-up anger and allows us once again to live with our neighbors on terms. That is why he is both violently killed and, once dead, revered as a savior. Victimization is therefore a way in which societies establish internal peace. One function of religion is to limit the damage that this victimization causes by providing sacrificial surrogates, such as the animals slaughtered at the altar or the fictional narratives of gods that die and rise again. 
Girard finds a kind of proof of the Christian morality in his observations, Christ being identified as the one scapegoat who is able to understand and forgive his persecutors and therefore to establish forgiveness rather than violence at the heart of the social order. Now those speculations are inevitably highly controversial. Nevertheless, it is undeniable that we rational beings are given to irrational violence, that resentment is a large part of its cause, and that typecasting and scapegoating may permit its release, but may also vastly amplify its extent. And I am inclined to agree with Girard that the Christian Gospels set before us an example of the only known antidote to this potentially disastrous human failing, which is the habit of forgiving those who hate you and those whom you are tempted to hate. The Quran invokes at every point the mercy, compassion and justice of God. But the God of the Quran is not a lenient God, even if he has come a long way from the barbaric acts attributed to him in the Old Testament. In his Quranic manifestation, God forgives sparingly and with obvious reluctance. He is manifestly not amused by human folly and weakness, nor indeed is he amused by anything. The Quran, unlike the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament, is a joke-free zone. And it vividly reminds us of another of Christianity's gifts to us, which is the gift of irony. There is already a developing streak of irony in the Hebrew Bible, one that is amplified by the Talmud. But a new kind of irony dominates Christ's judgments and parables, which look on the spectacle of human folly and wryly show us how to live with it. A telling example of this is Christ's verdict in the case of the woman taken in adultery. Let he who is without fault cast the first stone. In other words, come off it. Haven't you wanted to do what she did and already done it in your hearts? It has been suggested that this story is a later insertion, one of the many culled by the early Christians from the store of inherited wisdom attributed after his death to the Redeemer. Even if that is true, however, it merely confirms the view that the Christian religion has made irony central to its message. And it was a troubled post-enlightenment Christian, Søren Kierkegaard, who pointed to irony as the virtue that united Socrates and Christ. If I were to venture a definition of this virtue, I would describe it thus. Irony is a habit of acknowledging the otherness of everything including yourself. However convinced you are of the rightness of your actions and the truth of your views, the ironical uh, advice is to look on them as the actions and the views of someone else and rephrase them accordingly. So defined, irony is quite distinct from sarcasm. It is a mode of acceptance rather than a mode of rejection. And it points both ways. Through irony, I learn to accept both the other on whom I turn my gaze and also myself, the one who is gazing. Irony is not free from judgment. It simply recognizes that the one who judges is also judged. The West's democratic er inheritance stems, it seems to me, from the habit of forgiveness. To forgive the other is to accept his otherness and therefore to grant him in your heart the freedom to be. It is therefore to acknowledge the free individual as sovereign over his or her life and free to do both right and wrong. A society which makes permanent room for forgiveness therefore tends automatically in a democratic direction since it is a society in which the voice of the other is heard in all decisions that affect him. Irony, which is the recognition and acceptance of otherness, amplifies this democratic tendency and also helps to thwart the mediocrity and conformity that are the downsides of a democratic culture. We're allowed to laugh at each other's absurdities. It seems to me, therefore, that forgiveness and irony lie at the heart of our civilization and that they are both what we have to be most proud of and our principal means to disarm our enemies. They underlie our conception of citizenship as founded in consent and they are expressed in our conception of law as a means to resolve conflicts by discovering the just solution to them. 
It's not often realized that this conception of law has little in common with the Sharia of Islam, which is regarded as a system of commands issued by God and not capable of or in need of further justification. God's commandments are important in setting limits to what we cit citizens of Western democracies can do or discover, but our law itself results from the human attempt to resolve our own conflicts by treating each party to them as a responsible individual acting freely for him or herself. This is especially so for the English, whose system of common law consists of freedoms won by the citizen from the state, which the state must then uphold. The Sharia, by contrast, consists of obligations imposed by God, which the courts must then enforce. And here in Canada, um, that you are, of course, now experiencing the conflict over this issue when some of your communities are demanding the right to regulate their private lives, at least, by the Sharia. In order to bring these, those thoughts to bear on our situation today, um, it's necessary, I think, first to try to understand the real threats to Western civilization, and in particular the threat from terrorism. There is a kind of terrorism that came into the world uh, in the 19th century with the Russian nihilists. Uh, it was not simply a, a release of the destructive forces that brood in all of us, uh, and which um, have led to the bloodbaths that litter the pages of history. Russian terrorism of the 19th century kind had its roots in the Enlightenment, in the idea of human equality, and in the attitude of resentment. Terrorists of this familiar kind have been a part of European politics ever since the Bolsheviks established the style. Sometimes they furnish themselves with a cause, like the IRA or uh, the Basque Eta, making belief, uh, believe that the achievement of a united Ireland or a Basque national state, uh, with that achievement their goals will be f uh, finally realized and they can lay down their arms. More often, however, they are causeless or <coughs> animated by a cause so vaguely and metaphysically characterized that nobody, least of all themselves, could believe it to be achievable. Such were the Italian Red Brigades and the German Bader Meinhof Gang of my youth. Uh, the vague or utopian character of the cause is an important part of its appeal, for it means that the cause does not define or limit the action. It is waiting to be filled with meaning by the terrorist himself. The terrorist is not searching to change the world, but to change himself. His cause is part of a search for meaning. To kill someone who has neither offended you nor given just cause for punishment, you have to believe yourself wrapped in some kind of angelic cloak of justification. You then come to see the killing as showing that you are indeed an angel. Your existence is given its final ontological proof. The exaltation pursued by terrorists is characteristically a moral exaltation a sense of, of being beyond the reach of ordinary human judgment, radiated by a self-assumed permission of the kind enjoyed by God. Terrorism of this kind, in other words, is a search for meaning, the very meaning that citizenship, conceived in the abstract terms that I earlier proposed, cannot provide. Even in its most secularized form, terrorism involves a kind of religious hunger. Now, it is very difficult to kill the innocent Mrs. Smith and her children as they go about their family shopping. Hence, this strategy for ego building cannot begin simply from the desire to kill. Mrs. Smith must become something else, a symbol of some abstract condition, a kind of incarnation of a universal enemy. Hence, all terrorists of the modern kind lean on theories which remove the humanity from the people they target. Marx's, Karl Marx's theories served this purpose well since they created the idea of the bourgeoisie, the class enemy, who had the same function in Bolshevik ideology as the Jew in the ideology of the Nazis. Mrs. Smith and her children stand behind the target, which is the abstract bourgeois family. It just so happens that when the bomb hits this target made of fictions, the shrapnel passes easily through into the real body of Mrs. Smith. Sad for the Smiths, and often you will find terrorists making a kind of abstract apology, saying that it was not their fault that Mrs. Smith got clobbered, 
and that really people ought not to stand behind targets in quite that way. Islamist terrorists are of a different kind, even if animated at some level by the same troubled search for meaning. Ideas of liberty, equality or historical right have no influence on their thinking and they are not interested in possessing the powers and privileges that their targets enjoy. The things of this world have no real value for them and if they covet power it is only because power would enable them to establish the kingdom of God in the total ruin of the blasphemous projects that currently stand in God's way. Their carelessness of others' lives is matched by a carelessness towards their own. Life for them has no particular value and death beckons constantly from the near horizon of their vision. People inoculated by the culture of repudiation are reluctant to acknowledge the search for meaning as a human universal and tend to believe that all conflicts are really political concerning who has power over whom. They are apt to believe that the causes of Islamist, Islamist terrorism lie in the social injustice against which the terrorists are protesting and that their regrettable methods are made necessary by the fact that all other attempts to rectify things have failed. This seems to me radically to misinterpret the motives of terrorism in general and of Islamism in particular. Although the Islamist terrorist, like the European nihilist, is, prim is primarily interested in himself and his spiritual condition, he has no real desire to change things here below where he does not belong. He wants to belong to God, not to the world, and this means witnessing to God's law and kingdom by destroying whatever stands in its way, his own body included. Death is his ultimate act of submission. Through death he is dissolved into a new and immortal brotherhood. The terror inflict inflicted by his death both exalts the world of brotherhood and casts a devastating blow against the rival world of strangers in which citizenship, not brotherhood, is the binding principle. This, I think, is why we should recognize that we are faced by a new kind of threat, one that does not have limited or negotiable objectives, which we cannot easily meet with a military confrontation and which cannot be deterred by the usual means. There is nothing we can offer the Islamists that will enable them to say that they have achieved their goal. It is undeniable that if they succeeded in destroying a western city with a nuclear bomb or a whole population with a deadly virus, they would regard this as a triumph, even though it conferred no material, political or religious benefit whatsoever. Now, of course, the mass of ordinary Muslims would be appalled at such an event and would regard mass murder of the kind contemplated by Al-Qaeda as an outrage and something absolutely forbidden by the law of God. And there are encouraging signs that Muslims are attempting to find the way to declare publicly that they, like us, are committed to the love of neighbor, even when the neighbor is of another faith. However, we should take note here of two important facts. The first is that Islam has never succeeded in establishing any decisive source of religious authority apart from the holy book itself. Each spiritual leader is, like the Ayatollah Khomeini, self-appointed to the role and has no credibility outside his own circle of followers. People often say, what a pity it is that Islam has had no Protestant reformation. In fact, it is one unending series of Protestant reformations each of which claims to be the absolute truth in the matter of man's obedience to God. The second important fact, and it is, I believe, connected, is that Muslims show a abili remarkable ability to turn a blind eye to the atrocities committed in the name of their faith and to unite against anyone who disparages it. The notorious Danish cartoons caused outrage, uniting Muslims everywhere in acts of destruction and calls for revenge. A few days later, the al Askari Mosque, which is one of the holiest places of the Shia uh, community, was blown up. All Muslims knew that it was done by Muslims, but where were the protests outside Iraq? Muslims have been far, by far the greatest, number, uh, greatest among the numbers of those killed by Islamists, but when do Muslims mention this fact? And after all, what were the infamous cartoons about? 
if not the effort to make us look at the atrocious things that are done in the Prophet's name. Does he approve or doesn't he? Muslims must face up to this question, but a rooted double standard often prevents their turning on fellow Muslims the righteous anger that they turn on the enemies of the faith. Double standards of this kind, it seems to me, are the direct result of the loss of irony. They stem from the inability to accept the otherness of everything, to stand outside one's own opinions and even one's own faith so as to see it as the faith of someone else. Not that Islam has always lacked irony in this respect. The works of the Sufis, Sufis abound in it. Uh, but few of the Islamists seem to have uh, encountered those works or indeed anything else of the intellectual tradition to which they, of the faith to which they belong. This is one of the facts that persuades me that the confrontation that we're involved in is not uh, political or economic. It's not the first step towards a negotiation or a calling to account. It is an existential confrontation. The question that is being put to us is, what right do you have to exist? By answering none whatsoever, you invite the reply, that's what I thought. An answer can avert the threat only by facing it down. And that means being absolutely convinced that we do have a right to exist and are prepared to concede an equal right to our opponent, though only on condition that the concession is mutual. No other strategy, it seems to me, has a chance of succeeding. Now, many people believe that the threat issuing from the Islamists has been exaggerated, that the reaction to 9-11 was both excessive and unguided by any real sense of what could be achieved by force or politics. Some have gone further and questioned the whole strategy of the American leadership. To use war as an instrument of policy, they argue, is a prolonged provocation calculated to produce precisely the opposite of the goal intended. And, and there may be truth in that. Nevertheless, this does not allow us to discount the threat that I've been describing. Al-Qaeda may be weak, the whole conspiracy to destroy the West may be little more than a fiction in the brains of neoconservatives, who are themselves maybe a fiction in the brains of liberals. But the threat does not come from a conspiracy or from an organization. It comes from individuals undergoing a traumatic experience that we do not fully understand. The experience of a deracine Muslim confronting the modern world and the modern Western city and without the benefit of the two gifts of forgiveness and irony on which we so successfully draw. Such a person is an unpredictable byproduct of uncomprehended circumstances, and our best efforts to understand his motives have so far suggested no policy that would deter attacks of the kind that we have seen in America, uh, Britain and Spain. What then should be our stance in this existential confrontation, in conclusion? It seems to me to be right to emphasize the very great virtues and achievements that we have built on our legacy of tolerance and to show a willingness to criticize and amend all the vices to which it has also given undue space. I think we should accept uh, the legitimate criticisms that Muslims make of our de decadent and licentious approach to sex, marriage and the family and that we should make those criticisms our own. We should resurrect Locke's distinction between liberty and license and make it absolutely clear to our children that liberty is a form of order, not a license to anarchy and self-indulgence. We should cease to mock the things that have mattered to our parents and grandparents and be proud of what they achieved. This is not arrogance, but a just recognition of our privileges. And we should drop the multicultural waffle that has so confused public life in the West and reaffirm the core idea of social membership in the Western tradition, which is the idea of citizenship. By sending out the message that we believe in what we have, are prepared to share it, but not prepared to see it destroyed, we do the only thing that we can do to diffuse the current conflict. And because forgiveness is at the heart of our culture, this message ought surely to be enough even if we proclaim it in a spirit of irony. Now those are my thoughts. Now it's up to you to refute them. Thank you.